<clears throat> in the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Most beloved Orthodox people, today is the Sunday before Theophany, and the Church in its wisdom reveals to us how our Lord prepared for Theophany. And in revealing this to us, it prepares us for Theophany. The deacon read the first gospel reading to you today, but the second one beautifully ties with it. The Lord has sent the last prophet of the Old Testament, the final prophet. Our Lord Jesus is the prophet that Moses spoke of. But the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets. He is coming to prepare the people for this revealing. Theophany is the manifestation of God in which the Holy Trinity will appear to men, will reveal himself to mankind in a way that he has not done so before. In the past, everything was veiled. David spoke of, of the Trinity in a veiled way. He spoke of different persons. There are many parts of the Old Testament in which the Lord says, we will go down. Thus, the Holy Trinity is mentioned many times, but now it is to be revealed. So the Lord sends his prophet to the people to give them another kind of knowledge, and that possessing this knowledge, they'll be able to receive the knowledge of God. And what does the Holy Baptist do? He goes among the people and he preaches to them, saying that they should repent of their sins, that they should confess them publicly, that they should go into the Jordan and be baptized by him unto repentance, unto remission of sins. He's calling them to the knowledge of sin, to the awareness of sin, and this is an all-important kind of knowledge. The Baptist says some hard things, and if you read the other Gospels, he will say a lot of different things to the people, and some of them seem quite fearsome. But in reality, he does all of it out of love. There was this beautiful icon that was in this OCA calendar, and a long time ago, I cut it out as a lay person. I cut it out because I loved it so much. And this icon was one of a kind. It was this image of St. John the Baptist, and he is holding a chalice, which is not unusual. In the chalice, there is blood, and there is the outline of a human figure inside this chalice. So obviously he is pointing to this chalice. He's saying, this is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. But that's not the interesting part of this icon. The icon showed John the Baptist's face in a very interesting way. His face was very gaunt, very ascetical. This is not unusual. But if you looked at the eyes of St. John, his eyes were so different than they are normally shown. St. John's face was filled with seriousness, kind of sadness, incredible compunction and contrition, but at the same time, gentleness and mercy. It's very hard to explain how this photograph could look, this, this icon could look this way, but it was very profound. And I ended up giving it to a friend of mine, which I actually regret, and he, um, <laughs> later on I heard that he didn't like the icon, which made me even more sad because this image was so beautiful. And he said to me, this icon looks too much like Christ. This is wrong. And I'm kind of thinking, that's ridiculous. Who in the world would look more like Christ than John the Baptist, except the mother of God? John the Baptist is the greatest man born of women, according to our Lord. So who else would look more like Christ? But St. John came and he preached repentance. He preached to the people so that they would know their sins and to give them this knowledge. And he did this out of great love because being a man of God and being a wise man, he knew what David said was true. A broken and contrite heart, a broken and humbled heart, God will not despise. And if people want to receive this knowledge of God, they have to have another kind of knowledge. Our Lord says this too. When our Lord begins his ministry, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he gives his Beatitudes. And what does he say? He begins by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are so poor that they know they have no virtues. Blessed are those who don't rely upon themselves. Blessed are those who realize that they have no strength. Blessed are those who in their weakness plead to God. Then he goes on, he said, Blessed are those who mourn right after this, for they shall be comforted. When a man has knowledge of sin, he immediately realizes he is in poverty. And when he realizes he's in poverty, he weeps over it. And when he weeps, the Lord comes to him and comforts him and gives him a consolation and gives him knowledge. Because what happens after mourning? Then he says, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure, blessed are the peacemakers, and finally, blessed are those who become worthy to be martyrs for Christ, to suffer. 
But it all begins with poverty and mourning. Elsewhere, the Lord says, Woe to you who laugh, for you shall weep. But blessed are you who weep, for you shall laugh. But all of this comes from this knowledge that God gives to us. And you see, God is so profoundly loving that the Lord's only desire is that he wants to reach out and grab every single man he has made and press him to his breast and kiss his head and say, Son, I've been waiting for you. Right? It's not in vain. It's not bizarre that our Lord gave us the, the image of the prodigal son because that's exactly what the father is. He's exactly like this. The father races out to meet the son, even though he looks ridiculous in his you know, wonderful robe. But he races out to grab the son and kisses him. And the son has this line set up, right? Oh, father, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. He says, I don't care. I love your son. And not only that, here's a ring. Slay the fatted calf. Come back into the kingdom. Return again. However, this is all true. But the problem is, is that the Lord cannot heal those who don't want to be healed. And he cannot help those who do not know that they are sick. Or do not can even <coughs> consider that they are sick. You see, this knowledge of illness is so important. Because if a man does not know he's sick, he won't go to the doctor. And if a man is arrogant and doesn't believe he needs to be healed, he will not accept treatment. He won't. And so the Lord establishes us with this knowledge. He seeks us to have this knowledge. And if you study the lives of the saints, every saint began this way. Every saint who wanted to know God, who wanted to climb to heavenly knowledge, began with this kind of knowledge. What's so interesting is there are certain of the Latin mystics, some of the Catholic mystics, who didn't begin this way. And it's so interesting sometimes to compare them. Saint Sophroni, this great saint, he read this man named John of the Cross, a very well-known man that the Catholic Church has glorified. John of the Cross suffered a lot. He, he experienced what he called abandonment by God. Saint Sophroni read this and he said, yes, some of this I can, I can agree to, or some of it I can, I can experience. I've experienced things like it. But what's so interesting about these different people is that John of the Cross begins his spiritual life by saying, I want an experience of God. I want, I want an experience of some kind. Now, the desire for us to say, I want to be in heaven. I want to behold God's glory. I want these things. There's nothing wrong with this because this is what we're called to. But the problem is that kind of desire can only be tempered by humility. If it's not tempered with humility, there's a subtle pride in it. Because if you compare the other saints of our church, St. Seraphim, St. Herman, and all the fathers, it doesn't matter. Go to St. Anthony. Go all the way to St. Siloan. I don't care. Go study all of them. They're all the same. They all begin with an acute knowledge of sin. St. Seraphim, this great man, all he knew was that he had sin. He knew about God, but his real knowledge was that he was sinful. And this sinful, this knowledge of sin deprived him of any interest in visions or any interest in great things because he said, all I want is to repent. And because he had love and he had knowledge of sin, the burning desire of repentance ever burned within him always. And this is what he sought always. St. Siloan was the same. He had an acute awareness of his sins. And then he went to Manathos and spent the rest of his life repenting. Right? This awareness of sin is so important. It's the most precious form of knowledge we have. Because this knowledge leads to every other good knowledge. As long as possessing this knowledge, you also cling to Christ. You cling to his mercy, but at the same time know that you're a sinner. This is exactly what St. Solomon meant when he said, Keep your mind in hell and despair not. So St. John the Baptist today, he comes and he says to us, Children, repent of your sins and confess them. And in confessing them, you will find the fullness of God. You will find this truth. Your hearts will soften. And the Baptist receives everyone who comes to him, and it seems that they all do it. They all confess, except for one group. The scribes and the Pharisees come not to confess if they don't want to. They come to ask John, who are you? What are your credentials? And John the Baptist says, you vipers, get out of here. <laughs> um, why are you fleeing from the destruction that is to come? And the truth about the Pharisees is that in not possessing this knowledge, they murdered themselves before they murdered anyone else. They drove spears and spikes and nails through their own hearts and through their own consciences. And when they had killed them, they went on to start killing others. Did you know that they are the ones who killed John the Baptist's father? They are the ones who demanded that Zachariah be murdered. They carried it out. Then when Christ began to preach, they raged against Christ too. Especially when they saw him heal the man with the withered hand. All the stories. And when they had, when they had prevailed upon the Romans to, to execute Christ, they went on to kill Stephen. They killed John, James, the brother of John. They threw the brother of Christ off the temple. And they continued, because not having a conscience anymore, not having knowledge of sin, their hearts had become hard. And in becoming hard, that's all they could do, was commit these acts of wild violence. And John the Baptist, 
<clears throat> Seeing this, rebukes them. Brothers, we have to flee from the hard-heartedness that we all possess. And the only way to do this is to, on one hand, grab a hold of God's mercy, and on the other hand, know our sins. Abba Isaac says continually, he says, knowing your sins is more powerful than raising the dead. It's more important. It's more important for a man to know his sins than to see angels or to converse with heavenly beings or to have visions. Because the knowledge of sin guarantees that you're on the right path. It guarantees that you're on the path towards purity of heart. And the men who know their own sins, they break down. They fall apart. When they see their sins, their heart softens and it begins to crash. And they can no longer be hard of heart. And they start to weep and they start to say, God, forgive me. And as they become soft, they, become, they come to have a heart that God can live in, that he can dwell in. And to whom he can then reveal mysteries. Right? He can begin to reveal to them things. And all the people who confessed to the Baptist and repented, they are the ones who follow Christ. Soldiers, tax collectors, and harlots. And so, brothers and sisters, we should prepare for this feast by thinking and meditating upon our sins in light of God's mercy. And knowing who we truly are. And having this true knowledge, we can draw near to Christ. Through the prayers of the Baptist, may it be so. Amen.